have um, scheduled approximately 10 to 15 minutes of uh, question and answers at the end of the webinar. Um, and if we can get to any of those, uh, say all of your questions, we'll try and do a follow up um, after the webinar. This webinar is recorded and a recorded version will be provided via email uh, in 24 to 48 hours. This webinar is also uh, available in, um, on uh, scrumalliance.org and is eligible for one SCU. The information to claim your SCU will be on the last slide of the presentation. Let's go ahead and meet our presenters. Laura Richardson works for companies and communities to improve outcomes through um, particip particip ah, excuse me, participatory budget, agile portfolio management, and process improvement. As Continuo's VP of Business Development, certified instructor and Scrum Master, she runs discoveries and section workshops, portfolio prioritization events, customer research meetings, all of which uh, leverage powerful collaboration work or framework that can scale to very large projects thanks to their Weave and uh, Continuous Collaboration SaaS platform. We also are joined by Jesse Fuel, who is an author, coach, and trainer who helps senior leaders from Boston to Bangalore transform their teams and organizations. As a global entrepreneur and founder of virtuallyagile.com, he is distilled his experience in a handbook, Can You Hear Me Now, working with global, distributed, and virtual teams. He's also a graduate of John Hopkins University and is a double certified leadership coach and accredited instructor with four distinct Agile certification bodies. Welcome. Thank you so much uh, for having us. And Jesse, thank you for joining me uh, today to talk about inceptions and kickoff meetings for distributed teams. Super um, so, so as you all heard, we're definitely going to have some time for questions at the end, but um, you know, as you get them, feed them in because it will help uh, Jesse and I as we kind of talk to, I guess, our experiences around this topic and some of the best practices, and, and you'll probably hear a couple of, of things that didn't go so well as, uh, as well, so those are often really helpful. Um, you know, we, we've covered in this webinar series um, a number of topics, and, and so these are recordings that you can go ahead and, and listen to um, after this uh, presentation, but this one is really focusing on how do you start? Um, and some people call them liftoffs, other people call them exceptions. But if you have a distributed team, how do you kick something off effectively? And then how do you reap those benefits um, of having invested in the upfront time? How do you reap those benefits over time? Uh, so what we're going to talk about today is, is you know, what, what that meeting is all about. And like I said, they're, they're called a lot of different things, including, you know, the program in, program increment planning meetings, inceptions, kickoffs. Um, but we'll talk about some of the, the issues and problems that we've all run into. As we talk about that, if you have other problems that you run into, again, pop those in the chat. Um, and then we'll be talking about some frameworks and other strategies for addressing those issues that are oftentimes exacerbated for distributed teams. But in some cases, I feel like there might even be an opportunity to do it better because of the intention of addressing distributed teams. So that's why I'm, I'm super glad that Jesse's going to be here um, to help us talk about this. Jesse, is there anything you want to add into here before we really get going? No, I think we're, we're all coming together for a topic where we share a lot of common frustration and pain. Uh, a, a quick note at the top, this is... Um, so webinar is being hosted by the Scrum Alliance, but we are talking about techniques beyond Scrum. And I think that's an important note um, when we started talking about different kinds of agile frameworks and methods. And you, as a practitioner, might find yourself in a Scrum environment, you might find yourself in a Kanban environment, or scaled agile, or whatever it is. And and we're hoping that these techniques that we're going to be exploring and talking about and practices are going to be relevant to you no matter what framework or technique you're using. So we're going to steer away from the scrum marketing and, and just focus on a good community conversation about what works. Works for me. All right, so why don't we start with um, a quick poll question. Um, you can pick as many of these that apply, but what we're wondering is, what are the challenges that you and your in your company or in your teams? What are the things that you struggle with? 
and and Jesse, I, I'm assuming that some of these have applied to you in your your long life of, of working with teams. <laughs> so I don't know if anything pops out at you here, but uh, you know, the, the, for me personally, the first one kind of resonates. It, it's just really um, you have to have the intention to have a kickoff meeting with a distributed team, and I think a lot of teams don't do them. Uh, I I think that that really is a key issue. Uh, the first one that um, we we're, we're so excited to get started that we stop that, that we fail to stop to talk about how how we're going to be successful. What does success mean? And how are we going to work together? We just want to get right into the work and forget to have that kind of kick off lift off conversation that sets us up for success. I. Um, I also see that one of the frustrations is that we only do them for co-located oh, yeah. The idea yeah. that uh, you can have a virtual kickoff, liftoff, uh, team build, virtual team building. Ew, how do you, how do, you do that? I think that's that's one of the frustrations that uh, that my my teams run into. Yeah, we'll um, we'll give everyone time to continue to answer this, but um, if we take a look at the screen now, I think you can see some of the results coming in. So, um, you know, obviously I, I expected to see some people just not doing them because I, I do run into that as well. Uh, but it looks like, you know, getting the right people involved, um, almost half of the people who've responded so far um, struggle with that. Like, who should be there and how do I incentivize yeah. them to be there and how do I make sure that their time spent is valuable, right? Not just for the team, but for the people you've invited. Um, yeah, and then, Jesse, you predicted this one, but um, sleeping on a conference call, right? That, <laughs> uh, again, over 40% are, are talking about that. Um, if you've been one of the people who answered something else, um, I would love to know what that is, and if we can leave those things into the conversation, we will. But if, if there are other reasons why you struggle to have inception meetings, if you could just pop that into the question part, that would be great. All right, um, so let's Let's move on then. So let's talk about um, kind of the, the planning of one of these things. So I think that the pre-planning phase is pretty important. Um, there's and, and then this gets into kind of one of the first activities that you need to do is to figure out, well, who should be there? So, okay, half of you said you struggle getting the right people in there. Um, definitely uh, collaborating around it and discussing with your, your planning team who should be there is, is important. Um, Jesse, what, what other things are, do you think is important in the pre-planning phase? Well, really, just do it. Just, uh, I can't, the number one technique that determines success for facilitators who are hosting conversations and alignment meetings, the number one determiner of success, in my opinion, is to just plan it. To stop and think about what's, who should I invite? What, what does success look like? How much time should I allocate? Um, what what, what, are, what are some roadblocks or issues I anticipate coming up during this conversation? If you just pause to think about how you want your, your kickoff conversation to go, you've already put yourself in the top 10% of all facilitators in the world, as far as what I've seen. So just... Just go, yeah. Yeah, so we, we talked to um, a framework in here that you might want to consider. It doesn't have to be exactly this framework, um, but you know, a simple way of, of kind of plotting, and in this case, um, what we're looking at is degree of influence and, and you know, how much impact would this person have. And so, you know, when I use this uh, to help my team plan, we indicate two different kinds of people, right? People who are important stakeholders because they care about the outcome and they will consume the output of what we all do, but they may not necessarily be invited or even be appropriate to be there or maybe they can't get there for whatever reason um so yeah. there are people who need to be aware right but then there's lots of people who should be participating so, my so for those of you who are seeing this right go ahead sorry yeah so, so for those of you who are seeing this graphic and you're wondering what it means on the left hand side you see um different progressions of people that have influence and so they're they're flexing their muscles and progressively larger size so down in the lower um left corner you, know, you might have the stakeholder that has only a moderate amount of influence um and they have a low amount of, of interest or opinion about this initiative this team this product and then in the uh secondary 
are you've got somebody with moderate amounts of influence, but they have a, a little bit more intensity, and that's the thermometer down at the bottom side. And then what we would do in, uh, in, in kind of a live face-to-face uh, -face setting is we would put this up on a flip chart or up on the wall, and we would have people put red sticky notes to denote a name. To somebody that has significant influence in the upper right hand corner and also is very passionate about making sure we succeed, um, or who's somebody that has moderate influence, and that, uh, sorry, that might be a red sticky note, but then a yellow sticky note might be somebody that's like a little bit hesitant about our project. And they might have a medium amount of concern and, and criticism about it. So that's how this, this kind of visual works. Um, uh, Laura, have you used this uh, framework um, in kind of in, the, in an analog fashion, face to face? Yeah, yeah, it's um, definitely used for face to face. And for the planning team, it's something that tends to last because, to be honest, this may change, and it may, you know, um, as more people kind of help you plan for both who should attend and also who is going to care about your output. Um, I find that this is something that's rarely done once. Right, and then um, over, right? So it's, it's something that, that kind of sticks around a little bit, which is also nice to do it online for that reason as well. So as things come to your head, you don't need to run down to the office to stick it on there, but you can, you know, hit an online framework as well, or however you're, you're tracking this list. Right. Um, so, so this, all of this really, the pre planning is really down to, okay, eventually we need to get to the invitations and the agenda and the when. Right, and and I think the other part of pre-planning um, is, is just kind of thinking about okay, well, based on what we're trying to achieve, right? Um, that's also going to influence who's going to be there. So I, I wanted to um, point out Alan Grove's work here. Um, it's a great book if you want to pick this one up. Jesse, is, is this something that you've gone through and looked at or leveraged some stuff out of her work? Uh, well, that's, yeah, yeah, Alan Grove's um, yeah. graphic here is a really good. Way to summarize the, the book on the right hand side by Diana Larson and Ainsley Meese. This, the, the book, the liftoff book, I, I use it as a reference manual all the time. This is the book, and particularly in the Agile community, for getting teams set up on the right track, on the right foot. And there's, a, there's a section about chartering, there's a section about uh, alignment, there's, there's just a lot of good techniques for you to pull from and guidance about how to get things started effectively. Yeah. So, so, you know, now we're getting to the agenda part. Um, I wanted to point out that, you know, that there are agendas out there. And so I, the scaled agile framework um, agenda for PI planning, I thought was worth taking a look at. But what this applies, you know, what, what this says to me, Jesse, is that, hey, this is a two full day kind of thing. Right, and for maybe an in-person team where you get to show up with the coffee and the snacks and the lunch and all that kind of stuff and everyone's face-to-face, -face, something like this probably works pretty well. But I am, you know, I, I, I struggle with this when we have a distributed team to say, okay, we somehow need to, to find eight hours per day, two days, right in a row, right? And, and so, you know, I, I think we have problems with this, right? So I don't know if you, if you want to talk about some of the challenges that you've run into. Yeah, um, this is, it's a particularly uh, challenging um, in a virtual environment, trying to get everybody online for two days straight. And you have the time zones in, and you're going to have try to get people to participate for half a day because then they have to turn in for the evening, and other people don't show up until halfway through because they're just getting into the office. So a full two days can be challenging. Uh, yeah, and I guess, um, you know, people, you know, as soon as you move online as well, then I think the opportunity to be disengaged, you know, even if at times you're very engaged, right, but the opportunity to not be really paying attention increases, right? Yeah, I mean, we're looking at this graphic here that when it comes to, to doing all of these, these kickoff events and liftoff and, and chartering virtually, you got these three major issues coming up where uh, like distraction, confusion, uh, and, and incomplete uh, actions. Uh, walk us through this a little bit, Laura. Tell us more about these yeah, three challenges so, as we start moving into these environments. 
Yeah, so what, so after the slide, what we're going to be presenting are ways to address these things. But I think what happens is, you know, Jesse, you mentioned it, somebody comes late, maybe has to leave early. So you have, you know, the, the incompleteness around decision making, um, I think is amplified in an online kickoff. Because, you know, re the reality is what the team wants to be able to do is when this thing is over, right, when your lift off and your infection is over, you want to just be able to get to work, right? You want to be able to take action against everything that you've already discussed. But I think the opportunity to rediscuss and rediscuss and, and question decisions um, is, is, it can potentially be amplified for distributed teams because, hey, somebody was missing during part of the discussion or they missed something or they weren't there for half a day. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the draw or the pull to, to discuss it one more time, you know, is, is real, which means that you're delayed, right? The start is delayed. So it's, it's distraction, it's, um, you know, lack of getting to some kind of alignment because people may stay in some state of confusion or you, you're just not done yet. You spent your time, but you still feel like you're not ready to take action. All right, so, so yeah. All right, so Jesse, you're the one who told me about this, right? You said you tend to do these things in a much more broken up kind of way. All right, so right. I put together um, a, a starting point here, but this kind of agenda is by no means, you know, um, set in stone. But anyway, could you walk us through a little bit about, about how to think about an agenda online versus one that you might do in person? Yeah, now that we've talked about like our three key pain points, let's get to some actionable tips. Let's get to some good stuff here. And the first one is don't do it all at once. There's a lot to get done. And you saw whether it's the, the book Lift Off or, or what uh, the Scaled Agile says needs a full two days to cover in, in, a, in a particular release kickoff uh, or chartering event. If you're going to do that with multiple time zones, it's just, it's going to be painful. And so they might only, you might only have two to three hours of, of common overlap in your time zones. So spread it out over several days. I've done, a, I've done a few virtual events where I've had to log in for an entire two-day session, and it was brutal. And, and I'm supposed to be like one of these virtual collaboration experts, and I got distracted. And I got, I got tired and went for one too many coffee breaks and, and it's just exhausting to, to, to be in a virtual environment for two days straight. So instead, maybe maybe this is what Sprint Zero is about. I know it's a controversial topic. I know uh, that there are people that um, want to get started right away. And, and maybe there's opportunities to do that in your Sprint Zero or your Sprint One. But maybe you spend a couple hours during your first sprint just talking about where we're going as we do our first prototype or our first micro story or mini story. And, and day one might be about the vision and um, not just the product vision, but also the technology vision. And then day three, we're going to look at this story, brainstorm that. So the first, the first notion is um, don't skip out on the work because it's because of time zones. Don't skip out on the work because you're rushed. Just keep talking about this stuff over the course of several days, and you're going to get more alignment and more uh, more momentum than if you jump straight into a project and then run or bump into a lot of rocks in the road that you could have foreseen just with a two-hour conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's been my experience too, for sure. So, okay, so we had some things um, in day, you know, early on in this process, and again, you, you might rearrange them slightly, but, you know, the whole idea of, of what this team is. So, uh, in some cases, right, the team is new as well, right? It might be a new project and you need something that you're kicking off, but maybe you have new team members. Maybe everybody hasn't worked together yet. So, um, I think there are some really great frameworks, um, and I think, Jesse, you use the team canvas quite a bit as well, which is... You know, talk about each other and get to know each other, but also make sure that you build into your kickoff um, the working agreement, discussions around working agreement, so that you raise all of this and, and basically don't leave this kind of stuff up for assumption. Jesse, what do you think yeah, about that? Absolutely. And um, there's, uh, we're going to emphasize this again later, so I'm going to do a little bit of a, of a foreshadowing. What's good for face-to-face -face teams becomes mission critical for virtual teams. 
So it's good in a face-to-face team for us to sit down and talk about our beliefs and our value systems and our needs and expectations. And it tends to be easier to do with one person because there's some human energy in the room. But you know what? When you're virtual, you can't rely on that human energy. You have to actually be intentional. And you have to have this conversation even more so about what, what are the rules and activities that we're going to hold ourselves accountable to as a team. Because you don't have that kind of face-to-face connection. So this conversation becomes even more important. Now, I've done this um, either using the team canvas in the previous slide or in this one, the team operating model. Using something as simple as Microsoft Office 365 PowerPoint or Google Slides, where you put this graphic up on a screen and you have people drag and drop text right onto this background image for people drag and drop. Um, shapes. Um, uh, I know Weave is, um, is, a, is a powerful platform and Google Slides and Microsoft Office 365. So the point being, you've got to do this. You've got to have these conversations regardless of what technology you have available. Mm. Yeah, and, and some of them are kind of, I wouldn't say necessarily meta, but they're quite big, right? The, the, the working agreements around the team operating model, what are our roles and responsibilities and how do we all agree that we're going to work together? I right, so that that's, um, you know, kind of a broad topic and, and a lot of things could come up. So another benefit I think is of saying that we're going to intentionally do this online with whatever platform you choose to do that with is you can revisit it, right? You may have two hours carved out for kickoff and introductions on day one and allow people after that portion of the kickoff meeting is over, um, they can still interact with these online frameworks that you've, you know, that you've presented. So how, I don't know how many times it happens to everybody on this call, but then two hours later, you're like, oh, I just had this awesome idea, or wait a minute, I don't want to forget to talk about X, Y, and Z. So it's yeah. also a nice placeholder, right, for people to say, okay, now that that two hours is done, you know, at the end of the day, I have some more stuff I want to add there. And it, it's a collection point for that what used to be the water cooler conversation in the in-person meeting when it's over, you can still replicate that by letting people have online space. Right. Yep. And then some of them um, are are much more specific, right? It's like you, you should start this discussion too. It's not just how do we all work together as a team, but how do we define some really critical things that, like you said, just are even more critical if we distributed. How do we know we're ready to start working on something and how do we know we're done? Now, this is something that probably is going to last the whole week um, of a kickoff, but I think it should be, again, intentional. Yeah, this is this is huge because what, what it tends to reveal is your dependencies. It tends to reveal that um, what's in the blue does not cover the, uh, in the middle, that middle bubble about what we as a team are able to get done. It turns out that we're dependent on some designs uh, before we can get started. We're dependent on some... Uh, interface control documents that tell us uh, what, how we're supposed to uh, consume things. And then, uh, and then when you start discovering that, you start saying, okay, man, uh, I'm glad we know these dependencies now so that we can ask some of our team members to go flush them out or take care of them in advance of the upcoming sprints. And that's your definition of ready. And then likewise, we might realize that we can't deploy or deliver or roll something out into an operational environment unless we have some ex- some additional dependencies downstream, and that's the right-hand box. And so you as a facilitator, you would want to start typing into these boxes what the team says are our upfront dependencies and our downstream dependencies versus what we as a team can do in the middle. And just having that conversation, again, what's good for, uh, for that team that's face-to-face and talking about these things uh, you're going to surface a lot of issues that any team has to do. And that's why uh, something as simple as before, during, and after a sprint, like this kind of framework here, is a good conversation model. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so I think another good conversation to have, in addition to how we're going to work together, is what is it that we're actually building, right? Or what's our goal? What are we? What's the vision of what the reason we're all coming together? So, uh, you know, there, there's lots of ways to have this discussion. I think um, this framework the, on the cover um, is, is a, kind of one of my go-tos because these little boxes um, provide a lot of opportunity for the facilitator of this discussion to um, adjust them as well. Right, so these are the, what you see here, the, um, you know, again, imagine that you're on a, um, 
your team is featured as being the most awesome success story in the company, what are the things that are going to be the evidence, I guess, to show um, or to defend that position of it being amazing? So in some cases, you're actually looking for what, why the customer is happy or the, the consumer of your thing that you build. But there, there are definitely opportunities for metrics and, and really specific stuff in here, too. So, um, Jesse, I'm not sure how you or even if you use this one specifically, but my recommendation to people is adjust this as you need it, but have yeah. a place where people can come together to talk about what you're doing and why. This is a good. This is a good framework to to, uh, to put in front of product owners about their vision for what the success of the product is going to look like. Uh, Danielle Luco uh, has a question that she posted about when do we do these frameworks? So when you might uh, do we do we do pre work on, on on either this screen or the team operating model, the team canvas and then come together and discuss our different ideas, or do we just kind of create it live? And the answer is, do both. For some of these frameworks, it might make sense for you to hand, for example, this cover story, uh, hand it out to product owners or business analysts or customers and SMEs, people that are more on the business side of things, and say, hey, we're about to invest in this team. What would success look like in your opinion? Have them fill it out. And again, maybe privately using PowerPoint or, or using Google Sheets, and then send to you some of the preliminary independent opinions, and then that could be a good way to kickstart the conversation. Wow, looks like we had a lot of common um, items that, um, here. I've taken the liberty of all the quotes, putting them in the bubble here in advance of the meeting based on what you guys said. What do you guys think about this? What comes up and what pops up about these different visions of what our success story might look like. So with respect to these, these kinds of frameworks, you can either use them as a way to, to prime, prime the conversation beforehand, or you can just put a blank and empty version of this in front of the team and have them fill it in right there on the spot. Jesse, I, I love what you just said, and thank you for, for kind of highlighting that and thanks for the question. I actually think that for distributed teams, having the, or giving people the opportunity to do some preparation, um, it makes everything that much more effective. And I think the reason why using a framework like on the cover or some of the events we talked about as a catalyst for that is you're already setting the tone for a shared common language that people will be using, right? So if you just say, hey, think about your vision for success, um, make some notes and be ready to discuss it. People don't have a, a common mental model, and so they may approach that question from all different kinds of angles, which just makes your job as a facilitator of a uh, distributed team that much more difficult because you're trying to pull together all these kind of different mental models into a, a, a common place. But if you send out um, something like on the cover to everybody that you want to have think about this ahead of time, then everybody already has a, a shared mental model about how you want the question answered, so you can shave off time by yeah. having prep work that's kind of um, common for everybody. Another related question comes from Deborah, uh, I think, uh, Beverage, uh, Bever I think that's Beverage. Uh, Deb uh, asked the question, does a progressive approach make for more thoughtfulness? I find people get overwhelmed with the multi-day or full-day presentations and don't have time to digest and reflect. So uh, you don't even have to do a five-day sprint zero where day one we talk about this, day two, day three, day four, to get that thoughtfulness. That, uh, yes, that's right. By doing it over multiple days, then you do get a chance to think about the previous day's ideas and reflect on it. But if we just prepare with advanced work on this canvas, for example, and then and then give people to think about their thoughts and then come back together in a group session, having a sleep cycle in between conversations is a way to get more thoughtfulness going. So uh, that's a really good point, Jen. Thanks for bringing it up. All right. So, you know, Jesse was talking earlier about, you know, when you're thinking about some of your um, working agreements and looking at definition of ready or definition of done, you're already starting to identify uh, dependencies, you might also um, feel that there is some type of risk, right? So I actually find it helpful to, to, in the process, use frameworks that absolutely spell that out and can help keep track of that stuff. It's, you know, as the 
as the days go on that you're doing this kind of um, online kickoff. So there, here's a couple of my uh, favorite ones. I use these a lot. Um, a variation of sailboat uh, where you can um, specifically call out risks as well as, as issues or problems, you know, anchors in this case. Um, and also the enablers, right, things that you have going for you. So, so the sailboat is a great place to start to track this stuff. And I don't know about you, Jesse, but I also feel that having a really cut and dry kind of, of holding pen for the stuff, you know, in that the raid board next to it, you know, actually have a column for all the risks. And, and as people identify assumptions, put them there, right? And put the issues that you see coming. I, I just think it, it reduces anxiety or worry or concern when everything becomes visible. I, I think, uh, I, I love this visual here for, for two reasons. One, the point that you just made on the right-hand side. Imagine if you were on a conference call and you're like, for the next 15 minutes, we will talk about risks and then I will type them up. And then for the next 15 minutes, we'll talk about extensions and then write them up. And that conference call is going to get really boring. As soon as you have just a four column visual, boom, we're activating a different part of the brain. We're, 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 we're engaging more sensory input so that we have more engagement in the media than we have just with a video conference. So that's, that's what this graphic here tells me first and foremost. If, if all you're doing is dialing into conference calls, you're living in the 90s. It's time, it's time to turn on the screen share. It's time to get visual with this stuff. And then if you want to go to the black belt level, if you want to go to like like super guru master level, look at the difference between the left hand canvas and the right hand canvas. So the right hand canvas is a visualization of four topics. But the left hand canvas here is a metaphor. And that engages a deeper kind of brain activity where you're using analogy to tease out what are the risks and, and, and how do they counterplay some of our some of our strengths and win helping the team. And that, that creative energy can get even more uh, more ideas and points out on the table than just mm. a structured four-part conversation. So number one, visualize. Visualize, visualize. Number two, Consider using metaphor as a way to get even more engagement in your conversation here about risks and issues. Well, here, here's a metaphor for you. This is one that I love. <laughs> so <laughs> when you're thinking about, okay, well, so we have a vision of what we're doing, but now let's start to get into some more specifics about how do we how do we want to get there? How are we going to grow right, what we're building? And ultimately, you know, again, you want to be able to take action against all this work. So you know in your head that ultimately you need to know what that um, minimum viable product or the first release is going to be, right? So I often use a tree to visualize the growth of the thing we're building. And it, it, may, it may need pruning, it may need fertilizer, right? But the idea is low-hanging fruit is to and stuff up in the canopy happens later. And so the, the you know, you have the empty one on the left side, but the one on the right, I drew that little line on there to kind of indicate, hey, this is first pass at Everything below that line is, is potentially the, the first three weeks of what we're building or our MVP. Now, that's not the only way that you would, uh, uh, you know, address that, like, okay, what, what's the first task, you know, what are we going to build first kind of thing. But I, I find that when you get people starting to think about that earlier on in the process, um, it, it helps to build the intention for the ability to take that action at the end of the inception meeting. Yeah, um, this is Yep. This is a powerful metaphor. I, I totally agree. Because if you think about it, uh, 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 if, you're, if you're in the IT space, no system is ever done, ever. There's always features, yeah. there's always patches, there's always enhancements, there's always something more that needs to be done. There might be a little bit more energy in the early part of its life cycle, but if you send that out to products, today, as we speak, Apple is making its announcements for its latest set of products. They're never done. They're always growing organically out into the future. And so the, this tree is a great metaphor to describe what are some core foundations that we need, the roots, to, uh, in, in, in trunk, to set the stage for, like you said, our first set of offerings as a product or as uh, 
as an investment. And then down the road, we have this massive canopy of features. So this is this is uh, one of the most popular uh, frameworks and canvases to describe the growth of a product over the course of mm. time, and, and using the metaphor to, to encourage that kind of thinking. Yeah, and before we get, uh, switch gears off of metaphor, for kind of, there's one question that popped in um, about okay, how do we how do we really encourage engagement? Meaning, how do we how do we use these kinds of things so that people aren't just watching the screen and they're actually kind of active in it? Um, you know, I know that there are a lot of, of shared um, document spaces out there where you can all kind of um, get at it at the same time. I we actually use Google Docs a lot for certain things because of the, the real time ability to edit. So sometimes you could consider doing this um, with a, a, some kind of Google Sheet or even the Google version of PowerPoint. I can't remember the name of what that is now, but um, there you go. But, uh, you know, Centennial's we platform lets you do this in real time as well. So the idea is every team member is actually kind of having a maybe a two or three screen kind of, of online meeting where yes, you need a conference call, right? And yes, you might want to do the video call as well. But if you give people something that they can interact with physically or digitally physically, right, where everybody can add an apple or draw a line or express um, more detail around a particular feature or a particular capability of the platform, then they don't have to go off and, and read BBC news, right? Because you're giving them something active to do while they're also listening. So that, that's my answer to that is um, give them something to do that's relevant to the discussion rather than allowing their brain to get distracted. Yeah, I want to um, uh, I want to jump on that as well. This uh, this question from um, Uma Hiswani, uh, the about getting people to engage when they don't talk. What you're really saying is, I want everyone to be an extrovert, and in IT, that's just not reasonable. It's just not realistic that to ask people to be very talkative and chatty when that's just not how their brain is wired as an introvert. And so what we find is that the face-to-face -face office tends to have an unnatural bias in favor of extroverts because we're all together there and the people who talk the most, the people who talk the loudest, get the most energy, most attention, and then the introverts are left and kind of feeling stable. The virtual environment is an asset for some of the smartest people you have who just don't like to talk. Because now we can get them dragging and dropping apples onto this tree. We can get them typing their thoughts into IM, whereas before they just wouldn't be comfortable in talking. Um, this is especially true on the conference call, because on the conference call, it requires even more energy to speak up, because it's just awkward, and, and there's a lot yeah. of distortion. So the introvert-extrovert dynamic is one I feel is much more of a level playing field in a virtual environment, depending on how you as a facilitator can use those multiple technologies that you mentioned, like the conference yeah, and, it, and, the, and the digital. Exactly. And, and and also that I would say it's important to pay attention to the, the use of metaphor and not metaphor, right? I mean, there, there are certainly people who love the tree and find it immediately appealing and other people have to warm up to that because not everyone is wired to love every metaphor. So as you're selecting um, frameworks to help people, to help guide the decision making and discussion, be aware that too many metaphors won't work so well and no metaphors are probably a mistake as well. So here's um, um, another way of, of thinking about the product or service or, or project that you're kicking off um, to kind of think about, well, what's the business value? of this thing we're discussing. So, so the next, by the way, Jesse, just a heads up, the next couple that we're going to look at are all in that category of, of, of I guess, making sense of um, how do you turn the vision into a thing that we can ship. And I think there are different dimensions of looking at, well, what do we want to ship? And, and yes, it's the growth, the truth's great. But I think looking at the business value is another dimension of looking at it. And, and my recommendation is, do two or three different ways of, of making sense of the, the thing you're going to build, not just one, so that the multi-dimensions help people think more creatively. Uh, one of the, you're inspiring in my, my head, one of the other dynamics in a virtual environment, it's not just the fact that we, have, in a virtual distributed global environment, we have difficulty getting the product owners in the same room as the team. 
But many times, if you're a product owner or a scrum master or a facilitator of a product line, you have stakeholders all across the world. You have, they're, all, they're, they're in multiple offices, and that's another problem around getting the business aligned. What, what's the vision for this product? Where are we going? And so if you can start learning how to use these kinds of canvases uh, in a virtual environment, you might actually get more stakeholder input, broader stakeholder input, by giving them some kind of a virtual form to, to, to mm-hmm. offer their opinions, because it, even they are also distributed as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then as you as you talk about that stuff and invite others in to think about stuff like business value or growth, I like to keep this one this particular um, framework running in the background because a lot of the input that you're getting in terms of the, the purpose of the product and the, the roadmap of the product, you start to then be able to track um, issues and I guess in a more specific way, right? It's like okay, what are we in control of, and then what do we have influence over, and then what's the what what are we starting to identify that might be completely out of our control in this case this week, right? And so it, it just for me again this is a way of, of making sure that the team while you are aware of what you can't control or what might be out of scope, um, you you also keep the focus on well what do you have control or influence over as you're moving through all these different phrase, um, phases of a kickoff. It's really challenging when you're a team and you're facing up against several impediments like dependencies or knowledge silos or just a time zone issues. It, it's really it's really difficult sometimes to organize what problems can we make progress on ourselves without asking for help. It's the center circle. What problems really require management support and so now we have to make a case for maybe uh, hiring a new tester or we have to make a case for changing our infrastructure and if we can make that case to management and maybe actually get their support and make that problem go away that's the second circle but you know what there are some things that will never change we're distributed that will never change so guess what time to stop complaining and just talk about how do we adapt. That's the outer circle. How can you as a team talk about the way you as a team will adapt to an impediment, a problem, a situation, a frustration that will never go away like the time zone. It's just not going to go away. Uh, and so mm-hmm. it's important for this. This is my single favorite canvas, period. This is my favorite framework because it, it, it does have that conversation about control. Like, oh my gosh, there are more things in that center circle than I would have originally. And it can be incredibly empowering for a team to see some of those frustrations start to go closer in to their own control sphere instead of just being this, this like mishmash of confusing frustrations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so I think, you know, as, as we move through these things, you start to realize, especially for the distributed team, and, and by the way, Jesse and I both use these you know, in-person meetings and when we have co-located teams, there, there are just as useful, but the um, the impact of not using them for a distributed team is much more painful. And and so I, I think as you, as we go through these, you're probably starting to see that oh yeah, every element of a project has probably a framework that could go along with it. And and it, these aren't the only ones. We we just pick these because Jesse and I both like them a lot. Um, but you know, any way of visually keeping track of. Um, status or decisions or hopes and dreams and fears and all that kind of stuff is, is it, it's better to do it visually when your team is distributed. Yeah. Um, There's another question here from uh, yeah. Heike Fisher about the fact that uh, my teams are changing all the time. So as soon as I do this team chartering, as soon as I sit down and we, we and I help the team talk through these things about what they can control and what the vision is and, and who owns what, uh, people are pulled off and they're rolled on. We got different um, newcomers and leavers all the time. And how do I how do I onboard this? And I think the answer yeah. where you mentioned is this conversation is never done. This is a, these are conversations that you absolutely need to have in the beginning. But then you absolutely need to refresh every every several weeks 
And because you do have new people coming on board and you might not need to do it every single day or every single week. Mm -hmm. You can't assume that what conversation you had three months ago is still covers sufficiently what needs to be covered. So, so here's something that, that Luke Hellman, who I have an awful lot of respect for and love working with, um, he, this is something he says to me enough where I guess I just have to repeat it here. But he's, you know, his, his little pet peeve is uh, the team that, when they do a retrospective, asks the same question every retrospective. What's going well? What's not going well? What do we want to make better next time? And you know, he challenges teams to say, look, you've got to switch that up sometimes. And sometimes the right retrospective to have is to go back to the original kind of team working agreement and say, you know, our, let's review these. Do we want to make any adjustments to our roles and our assumptions around what each other is working on? Or do we want to make any adjustments to definition of ready or definition of done? So I, I think from just a retrospective cadence, another opportunity to go back and help either newer team members or just to make sure that, that the learnings that you've done so far don't require some kind of shift in the working agreement. Use that as a, as a retrospective topic every once in a while. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good one. What's next? All right, so um, there's a couple more frameworks that we're going to show you. This one is, again, uh, one of my go-to um, it's another way of thinking about a roadmap and also thinking about um, size of the chunk of work. So we haven't gotten stories yet or we haven't gotten to actually sizing a story that, that's coming soon. Um, but I think this is a good place to start because you can start to look at how hard is it to build something and the other axis here is how much value would it bring. So I think having... Um, you know, we talked about one of the goals of having a good kickoff is gaining alignment between the team members. Well, you know, in a, in a perfect world, you have the representatives of the business and the customer as well as um, the engineering um, team together. And so when, um, when you can look at and, and understand both of these axes, right, how much value would the ultimate customer get from something and how hard is it to build, when you can get to that kind of alignment between the team members together and have a place to go to look at it post-decision, um, this is a powerful one. I think um, teams get a lot of benefit from, um, you know, in the alignment area as well to, to do something like this. Yeah. Uh, usually what happens is, uh, for this conversation, is planning poker. And in planning poker... Mm -hmm which is one way to have kind of a collaborative conversation around the size of the thing. There isn't the element of value. There isn't the element of priority importance added into the planning poker conversation. So this framework here is a good way to combine both the effort and the value at the same time and having people drag and move things around. And then if there's one particular feature that keeps going all over this, this map here, that's the one that merits some conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to, to also point out that, that uh, looking at story storming and story mapping is also a way of being able to, you know, eventually draw that line about, okay, this is what we're going to deliver first. This is our MVP or our first release. Um, this, this canvas, I can't claim any invention on at all. Um, the, the whole concept is obviously not mine either, but um, uh one of our customers at Micron, a guy named Jason Dean, came up with this, and he uses this with distributed teams to keep track of and make decisions around um, stories and releases and release planning and things like that. So, you know, one of the things I would say is uh, use these frameworks that we're presenting, but feel free to build your own, right? This is something that, that he did, and I wanted to just make it clear that, hey, if you've got a great idea, Put it in a Google Doc or in a PowerPoint or, you know, in some kind of online platform. It could even be Weave. Um, but, but you guys can be authors of this stuff, too, and, and use what you can to help distributed teams visualize what's being discussed as well. Yeah. Um, uh, this, 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 this canvas here, this framework here in particular, was the one that when I was looking through uh, the, the materials here before we got on uh, into the webinar, this was the most interesting to me. So as soon as I saw this in your, in your slides, Laura, I jumped over to this link and started checking it out because this tells the whole story. It tells what yeah. the user journey is up at the top. 
And then once we've got the user journey described, then we need to start talking about what, what we're going to build to support that user journey and release one and then release two down at the bottom. And, and then, and, and then for those released name, that's nice, but what's the goal for that release and what parts of the, the epic are we going to splice into it? So story mapping itself is always very effective, but when, when you have something structured like this where we're going to define MVP1 and MVP2, uh, it becomes really powerful. This is this is a an analog version of well, some tools out there that that use uh, like um, stories on board is one, and then uh, and and then uh, I believe Jira has a story mapping plugin as well to identify MVPs based on different themes. And and so, uh, so you don't need a fancy technology for this. You can just pull out PowerPoint and, and throw it up on the screen like this. Yep. All right. So, technologies. You just kind of segued that naturally into there, but yes, um, I'm did. just curious about <laughs> <laughs> what are people doing now, right? It's, what technologies are you currently using um, to help your distributed team do this kind of thing? It, it could be a kickoff or a liftoff meeting, but if if you're not doing them yet, then any kind of meeting that you're having with your distributed teams, what are the technologies that you're using? Um, and and. Jesse, my guess is you probably would click all of them. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm definitely a fan of, of all of them as well. So how do you put it? What, which ones are you using? For me, the single most important one is video. If you're not using video, then you're losing literally 50% of the human interaction that you get when you're face-to-face. And, and so a video to me uh, is, is huge. Uh, as a way to create collaboration and connection. This webinar that we're doing right now is, is more one directional. I mean, we're trying to get a little bit of collaboration happening with uh, some of the questions. Uh, but for me, video tends to be the most important thing. Look at that. Mm-hmm. Uh, look at that. Yeah. It's, I know. Woohoo. Hooray for humanity. <laughs> Well, it, it, I think it also reinforces the social norms that you want to have, right? It's, um, I can't remember the blog post I just read yesterday, but, it, you know, it's pretty rare that in an in-person meeting someone just gets up and, you know, leaves and makes a phone call and, you know, pets their dog and gets a cup of coffee in the middle of somebody else's discussion, right? Um, but it's so easy to do that on a, in an online meeting where you can miss five minutes and, and mostly people won't even know you weren't there if it wasn't your turn to talk. But when you have video turned on, it, it just it, it turns it back into the social norms of an in-person meeting, right? You don't just get to get up and leave and be gone for five minutes. It's, it's like you wait for the break, right? So. Yeah. One more thing before we leave this list. Question from Steve Compton, who asks, what if a team is all local but likes to work from home and not come into the office and therefore enforces their communication to be at a reduced level? And, and I, would, I would encourage you, Steve, to go with the experiment. Go with the experiment and see how it plays out. And before you start the experiment, have them look at this list. Okay, guys, fair enough. Um, we're going to try to work from home a little bit more so that we can have uh, a little bit more ownership of our work and that whole empowerment thing. But let's have a team conversation. What technology are we going to use? What technology are we going to use so that we can maximize the value of the communication when we're at home as opposed to when we are working in the office? The U.S. government uh, did a study, the Department of Labor did a study that found, uh, it was about four years ago, one out of five Americans, and this is just in the U.S., but one out of five in Americans works from home at least one day a week. So this is the new normal. And, and we're hearing more and more as, uh, as the uh, Xers and Millennials and now the Gen Y start to move further into their, their careers, job flex is more uh, is the number one benefit that people are looking for, uh, that they're willing to take a hit on some of the other benefits if they can have more control over their time and more control over their location of how they get their work done. So as leaders in agile environments, these skill sets are becoming of uh, facilitating distributed teams. It's not, it's not about the time zone. It's, it's about the new normal that because the technology is emerging, like this list that we're looking at, because broadband is, is also a new normal in people's homes, that it's becoming more and more an expectation and not a luxury. 
Mm-hmm. So, Steve, give it a try and, and then hold the team accountable to having the same kinds of results that they would have otherwise, getting deliveries done, getting customers happy, and, and see how it plays out. And then ask the team, if it doesn't work as effectively, why not? What do you guys want to do? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's the other thing is, is just try things and make adjustments. And as long as everybody is, you know, it's a, a spoken expectation that, hey, some of the stuff we're going to try won't work and that's okay. Right, where every single thing that we do, we're going to try it. It's an experiment. If it works, we'll maintain it. And if it doesn't, we'll, we won't feel too bad and we'll throw it away and not do it again. Um, all right. So the, we have a couple more minutes. Definitely get your questions coming in as well. But, um, what are, you know, talk about these three takeaways, Jesse, that you wanted people to, to remember from this webinar. So if you saw on the, the technology list, there is a lot of technologies available. Use them all. Don't. There is no one tool that will solve every problem. In fact, uh, in preparing for this webinar, Laura and I were texting via SMS on our phones in addition to this to make sure that we had a back channel available. Have back channels. Some, some teams use two monitors, two screens at a team meeting, one for screen share, one for video. Use multiple technologies simultaneously to keep as much connection going. Um, and then uh, plan to replan. Just because you, uh, well, <laughs> just because you have a retrospective doesn't mean you're ready. Have a perspective. Have a perspective, a future perspective, so that before you get started as a team with this, with with some chartering and some kickoff, and then in your retrospectives, make sure that you're having some of these same conversations again and again. And again, frequently, and, and so that you make sure that anything new gets surfaced. And then finally, we've said this before, and it bears repeating, what's good for face-to-face teams becomes critical in virtual environments because there's just that much more distance. You've got geographic distance in many cases. You've got uh, the time zone. Some cases, we're dealing with people in different global environments, different countries, so you've got cultural distance. And then... In some cases, we're talking about a client-vendor distance. And so whatever distance you're dealing with, more conversation around expectations, more conversation uh, around uh, goals, and, and making sure that the format of your kickoff meetings is dynamic. Have a product owner kick off with a liking talk and then switch over to a framework and then switch over to free-form conversation and then switch over to a canvas. You don't do two-hour or two-day conference calls. That's a great way to get people to log off in frustration. So those are the three key points as we start uh, as we start closing up. Great. So uh, a couple of references for you. We've, we've tried to put links into the resource for the framework that we were mentioning. Um, and, and most of them that we showed are also available in Weave. So you can go to weave.continue.co and browse 170 or so that we have in there. Um, but I, I think that just supports really the, the bigger recommendation, which is keep it varied, like um, Jesse said, and and try different things and keep it visual, especially for the distributed teams. And then all the other things right, that distributed teams need to become better at or comfortable with, Jesse talked about it in his book. So if you want to go to his, his website, um, there are lots of places in there that you can get to it, but it, it's an excellent ebook. Thanks for the plug. Um, <laughs> oh, I read it. It helped me. <laughs> um, so we're, we're getting close to the end. We just have like one more minute. If there's any other questions, pop them in the chat. Um, here's the information that, that um, you were promised regarding the um, claiming the SEU. Um, anything else that my broader team here wants to add to this before we close? Hey, this is Jan. Um, I just wanted to thank you guys for um, presenting today. I mean, this is really good information, and I think it's um, even for teams who are just starting to learn Agile and um, Scrum techniques, I think that this, this information has been very um, informative and, and just a really good resource. So I want to thank you both for participating today. Um, so thank you. It's always a pleasure. Um, and so, again, any other questions, we'll answer them um, post 
webinar if you've got them. Otherwise, uh, the next one coming up next month is strategies for structuring and distributed teams. So that's the next topic that the Collaboration at Scale webinar is going to address. All right, great. Well, thank you so much, you guys. I really do appreciate it. Um, as we had mentioned before, um, at the beginning of the webinar, this was recorded and will be available in the next 24 to 48 hours. We'll be emailing out a link um, sometime around then that will allow you to go ahead and um, view the recorded version and then also get a copy of the slides from the presentation. I know a lot of people were interested in, in getting a copy of that and any links associated in the presentation. Once again, thank you so much for participating in today's webinar. Everyone, have a great day. Thank you.
Why do you need to leave the message? Здравствуйте. Мне вчера звонили из-за ассоциации репетиторов, но я был занят и не смог взять трубку часов в 11. Мне в письме попросили отправить фотографию студенческого билета, печати, и я поставил все печати и отправил эту информацию на почту. Там также просили подтвердить номер телефона, но как бы он у меня был на ремонте, и на данный момент я его отремонтировал, и номер действительный. Да, потому что до этого я был недоступный. Так, мне перезвонят, получается, через какое-то время. Хорошо, спасибо, до свидания. И вам тоже. Спасибо.